Good evening. Thank you for joining NAMI New Jersey's webinar. My name is Bina Batkar, Development Manager and Program Coordinator for SAMAJ, South Asian Mental Health Program of NAMI New Jersey. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Komal Shah, adult and geriatric psychiatrist on the webinar to discuss understanding psychotropic medication. That said, please note the information on this webinar is not a substitute for diagnosis, treatment, or the provision of advice by your mental health providers. Dr. Komal Shah, after working at various settings in an inpatient hospital, outpatient clinics, nursing homes, IOP, and partial hospital programs, is currently working at her own private practice in East Brunswick, New Jersey. She has an extensive and varied experiences over 18 years, working at Rutgers UBHC, George Otlomowski Mental Health Center at Perth and Boy in diagnosis and management of a plethora of psychiatric conditions. She graduated from NHL MMC Medical College, Ahmedabad, India, and completed her psychiatric residency and fellowship in New York. She is board certified in adult and geriatric psychiatry. She's blessed with two beautiful daughters and a very supportive husband. Besides her professional work, she loves to paint and dance. Dr. Shah, we are very grateful to have you here and looking forward to this presentation. I will now pass it on to you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Bina. Uh, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be here today. I hope everybody, you all and your families are safe and doing well in these difficult times. Um, welcome everybody. Today, my, the topic of my presentation is understanding psychotropic medications. Um, there are there is a vast array of uh, psychotropic medications. Uh, however, today we will discuss some of the most commonly used and commonly used ones. Uh, them being three classes of medications, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and mood stabilizers. So we'll discuss these three classes of medications today. First, talking about antidepressants. As you can see, there are several types of antidepressants, SSRIs, SNRIs, Remeron, Velbutrin, some of the older antidepressants, which were tricyclic antidepressants and MAO inhibitors. And the newest one is the uh, Stravato, uh, the intranasal ketamine spray. Uh, so we'll go through each category one by one. SSRIs are the most commonly used antidepressant these days. Uh, the older antidepressants like tricyclics and MAOIs are uh, not as much used anymore because the newer antidepressants such as SSRIs and others have much, much less uh, side effect profile. Um, so uh, um, discussing about the antidepressants, first and foremost, there is a black box warning on all of them about possibility of suicidal ideation. If and when you start taking the antidepressant, and you experience or start having any suicidal thoughts, or if you were having suicidal thoughts, which can be an integral symptom of depressed depression itself, but if those two suicide thoughts worsen, please, please, please immediately let your uh, psychiatrist or your um, therapist, counselor, whosoever know, uh, so that they can do the needful. So that's a blanket black box warning on all antidepressants. None of it is an exception. Uh, coming to the SSRI class of antidepressants, uh, it stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. It works on the serotonin neurotransmitter as the name suggests. 
Uh, it's good for depression as well as most, in, almost all antidepressants are good for anxiety disorders as well. SSRI is particularly for panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and also PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, some of the common side effects when we first start these medications, maybe I always tell all my patients in the beginning, you may have some headache, dizziness, uh, feel tired, groggy, or sometimes some people have the opposite, such as insomnia. Um, and sometimes in the beginning, you may experience even more anxiety, feeling like kind of jittery or antsy. These are common side effects, nothing to worry about. They will go away by itself as your body gets used to the medicine in about a week or two. Uh, so when, when I explain them this, I think it makes much easier for them to uh, comply taking the medicine. Um, otherwise, you know, they may um, uh, stop taking it uh, in the fear of such side effects. Uh, other, the, other some common side effects may be weight gain and sexual side effects. Now, uh, sexual side effects, all of them, most of them, I should say, have potential for sexual side effects. However, there are some newer SSRIs now called Vibrid and Trintelix. They may not have as much, much less likely to cause sexual side effects. And sexual side effects, unfortunately, is not a self-limited side effect, so that as long as you stay on the medicine, it may persist. There are various things that we can uh, try to do. I, can, I try to lower the dose, uh, maintain them on lowest effective dose, such that the antidepressant response is maintained, as well as they don't get uh, many sexual side effects or I may switch to another medicine, although there is no guarantee that other medicine may also cause sexual side effects. But at the same time, there is also, uh, it's not, it doesn't go that because uh, you had side effects on one medicine, you are going to have the sexual side effects uh, guaranteed on another one as well. So that can be tried. Sometimes we try adding a little bit of Wellbutrin, which is another antidepressant which does not have sexual side effects. So things can be done. And I would encourage you to talk to your doctor if you are having such side effects, nothing to be ashamed of. Um, another one is weight gain, which is also unfortunately uh, mostly not uh, self-limited. Now, among all the SSRIs, uh, there are, so naming all of them, there's Paxil, Prozac, Zoloft, Lexapro, Luox, and the newer ones, Vibrid and Trintelix. Among all of them, there are, these are usually the uh, same side effect profile for all of them. However, some of them may have some side effects, um, a more likelihood for some side effects than others, such as Paxil may be more so to have weight gain as a side effect or sedation, um, whereas Prozac is a little bit more on the stimulating side. Uh, so such minor differences exist, exist between them. Uh, there is a very rare low risk of GI bleed, so if you do have history of gastritis, gastric ulcer, anything like that, uh, please let your doctor know. Moving forward, another class of antidepressants, SNRIs, uh, which is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So as the name suggests, you can see it works on two neurotransmitters. SSRIs was just serotonin. This one is serotonin and norepinephrine. These are also good for depression and anxiety, uh, various anxiety disorders, as I previously mentioned. And there are uh, two of them in this class, Effexor and Cymbalta. 
effects are may have some data uh, for even refractory depression it's a good medicine um, a, a, but you may need to watch out for increase in blood pressure uh, if you do have history of hypertension, as long as your blood pressure is under control with the medication, it's okay to use it. But I would encourage you to uh, keep on monitoring your blood pressure and keep a daily log in the beginning when you first start the medicine so that you can share it with your psychiatrist. Simbalta uh, um, is also um, a, a, one of the SNRIs, and it also has FDA approval for various pain um, syndromes, such as diabetic neuropathy, any kind of neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia. So that's another one. Possible adverse effects are at the same as I already discussed with the SSRIs. Uh, however, in general, they may not have as much of sedative side effects as uh, some of the other SSRIs. Next one is the Wellbutrin. Pipropion is the generic name. This one works on dopamine and norepinephrine neurotransmitters. It's good for depression. It may not be so good for anxiety disorders. So for anxiety disorders, Wellbutrin may not be a first line. And especially when uh, we see many a times depression goes hand in hand with much anxiety. So if anxiety is quite prominent along with depression, uh, I may not want to start the Wellbutrin uh, in the, um, as my first uh, drug of choice. Also, it is uh, also approved for smoking uh, cessation, uh, quitting smoking. And it's a second line agent for ADHD. So for ADHD, of course, the uh, primary ones are the psychostimulants, but uh, a little bit of adding wellbutrin may also help. Now, three main possible advantages of wellbutrin are, it's the most weight neutral of all antidepressants actually sometimes may also cause some weight loss. And it is minimal to no sexual side effects and it has minimal to no sedation. Having said that, it's a more on the stimulating side. And hence, sometimes the main adverse effect that I see that affect compliance uh, is increased anxiety and agitation. Although that usually comes down after a few days and most of them are able to tolerate it well, there have been rare cases that I had to stop it just because they just felt so uncomfortable, restless, um, that I had to stop it. Uh, there is some risk of wellbutrin inducing seizures and this risk is mainly dose related. So it comes in 150 milligram, 300 milligram, 450 milligram. The dose of, uh, I'm sorry, the risk of seizures uh, goes up, especially when you go beyond 300 milligram. And the therapeutic dose is around 300, but if we need to go up, say 400, 450, that's when the risk of seizures uh, uh, may be clinically significant. Uh, and so if you do have history of seizures, history of brain tumor, head injury, actively so active substance abuse, such as cocaine, alcohol, opioids, any of, the, any of that, uh, Wellbutrin may not be a very good choice um, for that. Um, going ahead. Uh, Remeron, that's mertrazapine, is the generic. It works on norepinephrine and serotonin. It's very good for depression, uh, for anxiety, I would say. Depression mixed with profound anxiety is the classic, uh, uh, you know, case scenario where uh, adding a little bit of Remeron may do wonders. Uh, especially depression with profound anxiety, uh, who's not sleeping good, who's not eating good, has had much weight loss. For that kind of uh, 
for that kind of a patient, you know, Remeron might be a good choice. Possible adverse effect that may affect com compliance is uh, over sedation. Some people do feel too over sedated and weight gain because it does increase appetite and it may cause a uh, significant weight gain. Um, and very rarely there may be reduced white cell count, um, which I personally have not had much uh, problem with that. And I have used all the antidepressants uh, quite, quite a lot. <laughs> So the advantage is, as I said, insomnia, low appetite, and it has lesser uh, risk for sexual side effects as well as uh, gastric side effects. So if somebody just had a recent history of GI bleed, ulcer, which, is, which has not yet healed, uh, this one might be a good choice. So... And last but not the least, the newest one, Spravato, called esketamine. Uh, its uh, its uh, main advantage is it is uh, for refractory depression, treatment resistant depression. It is not first line because there is quite a you know it requires quite a bit of monitoring. Uh, you cannot just take it by yourself like you do take other antidepressants. It has to be, you have to go to a, a, a RAM certified center. The doctor or some other health care professional has to be there and you need to be monitored for at least uh, two hours, couple of hours after the treatment because as you can see, it can cause increase in blood pressure, dissociative symptoms like hallucination sometimes, disorientation, confusion, and over sedation. And other possible are it is, um, it, it does have abuse potential and it may have some cognitive side effects such as concentration and memory problems. Um, so, um, yeah, so you need to uh, be monitored and hence uh, you should not be driving the day of the treatment. Um, and uh, if you do have history of any aneurysm, arteriovenous malformations, hemorrhage, brain hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, please, please make sure you tell the doctor because those uh, are uh, the po uh, possible contraindications. And it is available at, as an intranasal spray. However, um, it has to be monitored and so you cannot take it by yourself. It can be taken along with other antidepressants. So uh, you do not need to stop other uh, medicine that you may be on for depression. Okay, so that's about the antidepressants. We'll move ahead to uh, the second category of psychotropic medications, namely mood stabilizers. Mood stabilizers, as the name itself suggests, it stabilizes mood. So they are primarily indicated for bipolar disorder, which is also another name for it is manic depressive illness. Um, and so what, do, what they do, they help prevent the depression or the manic episodes. So when your mood is going up and down, highs and lows like that, it's supposed to get your mood more on an even keel. So the types of mood stabilizer, lithium, lithium is the gold standard. Then uh, anti-seizure medications such as Depaco, Tegretol, Trileptal, Lamictal. And the third class is antipsychotics. Uh, which are some of these names, Seroquel, Zyprexa, Abilify, Geodon, Latuda, et cetera. Um, so talking about lithium, lithium it was the first one. Uh, it has been there for ages. It was a first one for bipolar disorder. Um, and it is good for bipolar uh, disorder for acute manic episode, as well as the maintenance treatment of bipolar disorder. It's good mainly for euphoric kind of mania, 
mania there is the high part okay so bipolar disorder there is high part and the low part the high part is the manic symptoms and the low part is the depression so high part the manic symptoms uh, the the mood may be either euphoric meaning extremely elated feeling overly happy or sometimes some people have, do not get that classic euphoric mania they get more of an irritable angry mood um, so lithium is i would say better for those who have more like euphoric kind of mania rather than the irritable uh, mood and it's also good for the depression episodes of bipolar disorder it's good for the maintenance treatment as i said already other indications it may also be useful for to control some aggressive behavior associated with other <clears throat> illnesses and also sometimes for refractory obsessive compulsive disorder uh, trichotillomania uh, which is obsessive uh, picking of hair and eating them uh possible adverse effects the main uh most common adverse effects of lithium that may affect compl compliance is tremors uh some uh, gi side effects such as nausea vomiting weight gain uh there may be some memory uh problems like they may feel like their reaction time is slowed they are not as sharp as before that kind of thing and it also has uh, some other side effects such as thyroid uh, side effects on your kidneys on your heart so uh, before we start lithium uh, we do a complete blood work and ekg and then after we start lithium we monitor these uh, thyroid and kidney enzymes from time to time um so um Uh, another important thing to remember is lithium has a very narrow therapeutic window what does that mean that means that the dose that brings the therapeutic response and the dose and the uh, dose that may give lithium toxicity that range if you look at the blood level the therapeutic response is usually achieved between blood levels of 0.6 to 1.2 and when it reaches around say 1.5 that's when you may start getting lithium toxicity and that can be pretty serious so that window 1.2 to 1.5 it's a very narrow window so we have to be very careful and therefore it's very uh, important that the lithium uh, blood level be monitored periodically from time to time and some of the measures to take to avoid such toxicity is keep yourself well hydrated a lot of fluids uh if you are on a low sodium diet for any reason such as heart problems or high blood pressure that may make you more prone to lithium toxicity some medications may also make you more prone so but uh so always discuss all your medications that you are taking and uh, keep yourself well hydrated um moving on uh anti seizure category they are depakot tegretol trileptal lemicta they are all good for bipolar disorder manic episodes now manic episodes as i said earlier lithium is uh, more better like better for uh, euphoric kind of mania these others depakot tegretol etc may be better for uh, mixed mania or um, mixed mania meaning where the it, mood is more on the irritable side or mixed meaning when manic um, uh, symptoms are associated with the depression symptoms as well so that kind of uh, episodes may be more uh, you know amenable to such uh, medications and lemictal may be good for bipolar depression uh some possible adverse effect uh, that can affect the compliance is mainly sedation 
uh, GI side effects such as nausea, vomiting, dyspepsia, uh, weaning, just that um, acidic, you know, um, gastric acidity. Uh, however, now some of the formulations that are available for Depakote, such as sprinkle capsules or extended release capsules, they have that coating, so makes GI side effects much less likely. So uh, these may be sedation, GI side effects, weight gain, sometimes hair loss can occur with Depakote. Um, so these are some of the side effects, the more common ones. Rarely so, there is a possibility of some liver damage and or low blood counts. Uh, and therefore, liver enzymes, we, we uh, periodically monitor while somebody is on uh, Depakote or Tegretol or Trileptal. Not much so with the Lemictal. Uh, so, uh, but it's, it's a rare side effect. However, uh, you know, if somebody also has, say, for example, alcohol abuse problems, those are some cases where you want to be very careful along with the Depakote because alcohol in itself can also cause liver damage. Uh, Lemictal uh, is usually very well tolerated, no need for blood monitoring, like say Depakote, Tegretol, Lithium, all these medicines, we have to monitor the blood level uh, from time to time. We have to monitor, uh, say, kidney enzymes, liver enzymes with Depakote, all that. With Lemictal, no such monitoring is necessary. However, there is one black box warning that rarely a serious life-threatening rash has been reported with Lemictal. So in case you are on it and you develop any rash, please stop taking it and call your uh, doctor immediately and also see your medical doctor. Most rashes are okay, uh, not much to worry about. However, rarely a uh, life-threatening rash has been reported, so you do not want to take any chances. So go see your doctor. Uh, usually such rashes tend to happen mostly uh, during the initiation of treatment, say like in the first two to eight weeks. Um, so, okay, so moving forward, we come to the third class of uh, medications for bipolar disorders, and these are antipsychotics. Now, antipsychotics, as the name suggests, they help with psychosis, right? Psychosis symptoms. So they are, of course, all of them indicated for a psychotic disorder, such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. Um, however, uh, many of them are also indicated and actually have gained FDA approval for bipolar disorder as well. So the, the types of antipsychotics, there were older antipsychotics, which are called uh, typical antipsychotics. These were say, uh, a, a medicines like Haldol, Navain, Prolexin, etc., etc., we don't use much of those anymore because we do have these uh, newer atypical antipsychotics that have much less side effect as compared to the older ones as far as the neurological side effects go. So the atypical antipsychotics, Risperdal, Seroquel, Zyprexa, Closeril, and Abilify. And yet newer ones are uh, novel atypical antipsychotics. Uh, in the last, I would say, couple of years to few years, have been Rexel-D, Geodone, Latuda, and Ryla. Now, the, if you see the side effect profile, antipsychotics, uh, you know, so we have, I mean, they do, all of them can cause extrapyramidal side effects. What is that? Extra pyramidal side effects means uh, any side effects such as Parkinson kind of symptoms can happen, tremors can happen, uh, Parkinson symptoms such as uh, slow shuffling gait, uh, tremors, and this can be of course bothersome to the patients. Uh, acute dystonic reactions can happen, akathisia, tardive dyskinesias, 
uh, dystonia is like you know your a jaw jaw getting locked up or turning of the jaw to one side or um, uh, difficulty speaking because the tongue may get enlarged. So and, and uh, these side effects are of course um, very bothersome and actually frightening to the patient if that happens. However. They, there is a treatment available uh, to reverse such dystonias. Uh, Benadryl especially is very helpful. Uh, Benadryl or uh, cogentin, uh, very helpful to um, prevent or reverse such side effects. Akathisia, what is akathisia? Sometimes with these antipsychotics or rarely so, even with the antidepressants, you get these side effects. This is, you know, you feel anxious, anxious like motor restlessness, like just very restless, can't sit down quietly. If they are sitting, you see them, they, they are uh, like, you know, fidgety with the legs. Uh, they need to get up, sit down, get up, sit down, pacing around, that kind of extreme restlessness that can happen. And then tardive dyskinesia. Tardive means long term. Uh, and dyskinesia are some involuntary movements that happen after you have been on the antipsychotics for uh, some time period. And uh, these can be pretty um, bothersome and may interfere with your quality of life. So uh, as you can see, these all movement uh, disorders, all these movement uh, side effects is much, much less with the relatively newer antipsychotics, uh, which are called atypical ones. However, the atypical ones may have more likelihood for metabolic side effects and weight gain. What is metabolic side effect? It tends to cause weight gain. It may increase your risk for increase in blood sugar, hyperglycemia. So if you have diabetes or if you are pre-diabetic, that can be a concern. It may increase the lipids, cholesterol, triglycerides. So that can be a concern. And if you do have what is called metabolic syndrome, uh, you can be at high risk for untoward cardiovascular or cerebrovascular events such as stroke, myocardial infarction, heart attacks, such. What is metabolic syndrome? So metabolic syndrome is, there are five things. Out of five, if you have three of them, then that means you have metabolic syndrome. The five things, the five uh, criteria are, one, uh, high weight, uh, meaning your BMI is above normal, your uh, waist circumference in males, if it is more than 40, or in females more than 35 inches. So that's the first criteria. Second is if you have high fasting blood sugar. Uh, that's the, this is number two. Number three, uh, high blood pressure, more than 130 over 85. Uh, number four is uh, high uh, lipids, meaning high triglycerides and low HDL. HDL is the good kind of cholesterol. So you want to have more of that. But when you have low of that, that's, you know, um, that is a kind of dyslipidemia. So uh, if you have these out of these uh, five, if you have uh, three of these, then you have metabolic syndrome. And that means that doesn't mean you have diabetes. That doesn't mean uh, you, uh, but that means that you should be cautious at this point. That means that you are at higher risk for uh, some of these uh, untoward uh, cardiac or cerebrovascular events. So that raise, should raise caution and uh, should uh, some work should be done to lose weight or get the sugar or cholesterol under control. So it's like a red flag. So uh, other side effects are over sedation can happen, weight gain, tiredness. Um, 
and um, the the relatively newer antipsychotics, uh, the most new ones uh, such as Latuda, Raylard, Geodon, they have less uh, neurological side effects as well as less weight gain and less metabolic side effects. So uh, those are some promising new medication uh, as far as adverse effect goes, but also you want to be, you know, um, careful in choosing those and uh, they are quite expensive because there is no generic available and most insurances don't cover them, unfortunately. Uh, the... Atypical uh, antipsychotics are, uh, uh, as you can already see the list here, uh, they are all good for schizophrenia. Some of them, most of them are also good for bipolar disorder. Um, and as I said, some, all these side effects are common to all of them. However, just like antidepressants, there may be minor differences here and there like Cirequil and Clauseril are more, uh, um, uh, Cirequil and Clauseril uh, are the least likely to cause neurological side effects. Risperdal or Vilify more likely. As far as cardiac e effects go, Geodon and Cirequil are more likely to have cardiac side effects. With Clauseril, there is monitoring of blood counts uh, is mandatory. And uh, Zyprexa and Cirec will cause more of the weight gain and metabolic side effects. Um, so that basically completes the discussion of the three classes of uh, medications. I would just like to quickly touch base on uh, non-adherence, meaning uh, these people, the patients stop taking the medications. And what could be the reason? They found the most uh, prominent cause is anosognosia. What that means is lack of insight. Uh, it's like a frontal lobe symptom that happens in patients with schizophrenia and bipolar uh, disorder. Uh, they don't feel there is anything wrong. So why should I take the medicine? I don't need it. So cases like that, we try to, uh, I think better way to handle it would be not to convince them, oh no, you have this illness and you need to take, no. Uh, I usually work with, okay, so what is bothersome? They may say, oh, I don't have schizophrenia or I don't hear voices, but I feel anxious. I can't sleep well at night. So, okay, so then that may be the starting point that I can you work with them uh, and try to convince them to take medication to help them with those symptoms. Second most uh, prominent is substance abuse. You know, uh, they may stop taking the medication because then they, they don't get that high that they usually get from substances. Third is cost, side effects, Stigma, people feel like, you know, uh, taking medications is some kind of a crutch or uh, that they are perceived as weak. So they don't want to uh, take the medications. Uh, you know, they need to deal with the depression or whatsoever by themselves. Uh, lack of effectiveness and sometimes cognitive issues such as if somebody has dementia, you know, they may forget to take medications. As far as the cost goes, I would like to mention there is a $4 list at Walmart, Target available. Many, many psychotropic as well as many other medical medications are available for $4. You should check it out. And there is an app called GoodRx, where if you download that app, it basically gives you, it compares the price for you and gives you the discount coupon as well. And it compares the price for you at various pharmacies. So that's something I would like to mention. Um, and some couple of other issues that I would just quickly touch base is vaping and some substance uh, use. Uh, just because I feel like, you know, uh, uh, lately, especially in the uh, adolescent and young adult population, vaping has risen to epidemic proportion. 
um, some factors why teens do it because they like the flavoring that is very common peer pressure curiosity widespread ads and mainly the belief that uh, it's not as harmful as convention cigarettes which is kind of true but however vaping it does involve it has either nicotine or cannabis and that is risky and harmful to their health but they don't perceive it as such especially since the cannabis has been legal legalized so what should they know about vaping the kids and the teens that, that it contains nicotine just like cigarette and that it can be harmful to the lungs the flavoring uh, that they use also has chemicals that may cause lung damage the e liquid that they use has chemicals that can uh cause lung damage what they do is that e liquid is heated and sometimes it heated to a extremely high temperature if you do not have a good vape pen you know some of these uh, lesser expensive ones they don't use very good hard uh, hardware material so it gets it 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 uh, increases the temperature not to vaporization to almost burning temperature and that can cause harm to the lungs nicotine and cannabis both can cause uh, damage to the developing brain of teens it can uh, uh, lead to higher risk of uh, smoking convention and cigarettes what should you do some safety measures do not buy cheap look for devices that state their vaporization temperature but just be uh, uh, for the reason that i just explained do buy from regulated retailers and read the label very important to know the ingredients cdc recommendation is do not use vape vaping products containing uh, cannabis and do not uh, buy products off the street um, cannabis is the most commonly used illegal substance uh, teens and young adults use it because they don't see it as harmful however i cannot stress this enough adolescents especially uh, in uh, kids less than 18 years of age when they start using cannabis and are regularly using it it alters their brain circuits their brain is kind of under construction it causes damage it affects their learning concentration memory higher brain functions like multitasking and even a drop they uh, they um, see some drop of iq by say 8 points those who start using it at less than 18 years of age it can impair driving a cannabis can impair driving slowed reaction time so um, you know uh, and it can cause depression anxiety sometimes and especially on mass psychosis those who have that underlying vulnerability those who are at high risk for psychosis say because of family history or whatsoever cannabis can um, you know uh, precipitate psychotic symptoms just two words about medical marijuana it's legal in new jersey now and what it uh, what kind of conditions it can benefit there is substance so the evidence for medical marijuana how much it may benefit it has been categorized uh, as substantial moderate and limited so there is substantial evidence that it may benefit chronic pain spasticity with multiple sclerosis and chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting in cancer moderate evidence for seizures and glaucoma and limited evidence for anxiety and ptsd post traumatic stress disorder tourette's and opioid dependence it can have drug drug interactions so it's very important that you uh, let your psychiatrist know you are have you are you do a medical marijuana and whatever medication you are taking uh, it can cause like altered sense of time in coordination red eyes it's not advisable for use in pregnancy at all it can cause uh, intrauterine growth retardation premature birth hyperactivity 
uh, some of the changes that has been made to medical marijuana use in the last year is before only two ounce was allowed. Now three ounce is allowed over a 30 day pre period. You don't need to recertify for an year. Uh, before it used to be 90 days, they are going to phase off the tax, home delivery will be possible. So these are some good changes uh, that have been made. Uh, these are some types of mental health treatment. I think I know we are kind of running um, the short of time. So uh, this is self-explanatory, uh, inpatient, voluntary, involuntary, outpatient, it can be partial hospital program or IOP, which is three to five days a week. So I'll try to quickly cover them. Uh, so it all depends on what a person's need is like. So that's to be uh, discussed with your counselor, therapist or psychiatrist. And these are a list of some of the community resources that I have, uh, uh, it's self-explanatory. And if you want to know exactly, okay, so say for example, uh, screening centers, which is psychiatric emergency room, you want to know where do I call? Uh, please go to the New Jersey Division of Mental Health. They have uh, uh, the directory for each and every county. Um, so much loads of valuable information is available there and all these kind of services are available all throughout New Jersey but which would be the nearest for you for uh, available in your county please go to New Jersey Division of Mental Health. Um, having said that I guess I conclude my presentation uh, here and uh, I hope everybody liked it, enjoyed it, and I'll open it to any questions, if any. Yes, Dr. Shah, we'll now be responding to the questions in the question and answer chat. We have quite a few. So the first question is, can you talk about the risk of antidepressants in inducing mania in bipolar disorder, especially undiagnosed? Okay, sure, yeah. So antidepressants, all antidepressants do have the risk of inducing mania in somebody who has bipolar disorder, whether diagnosed or undiagnosed. So if there is that vulnerability, therefore it is very important that first evaluation, psychiatric evaluation, where you mention all the symptoms, uh, the doctor may ask you, do you go through mood swings? I usually describe the manic symptoms. And so, uh, you know, if I get a feel that uh, this is somebody who does not seem to have just unipolar depression, but bipolar depression, uh, putting them on antidepressants may not be my first choice because it can trigger manic symptoms and make it worse. So in that case, I want to first put them on a mood stabilizer then see because uh, most of the time just with the mood stabilizer the depression may also improve if it does not then if it is bipolar type 2 which is less severe manic symptoms i may want to add a little bit of antidepressant cautiously however i try to avoid if it is bipolar type 1 which is the classic manic symptoms of the more severe uh, of the two i may want to avoid it Having said that, tricyclics, older ones, used, uh, have the most risk of inducing mania. SSRIs, SNRIs also have that risk, but to some lesser degree, and the least likely may be Wellbutrin. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Our next question is, can you talk about clozapine? It seems to be the most effective for my son, but is very sedating. Is there a new medication to try? He has schizoaffective disorder. Okay, yes. So clozapine is a very uh, good medicine, very effective. However, unfortunately, yes, sedation can be a potential side effects. Uh, you can try to take like more dose at bedtime, less during the daytime. There are some uh, maneuvers can be done like that. Uh, there are others available, of course, the newer ones, uh, uh, which may be a little less sedating. However, 
let me tell you for refractory illnesses refractory schizophrenia or schizoaffective which has not responded well to some other antipsychotics clozaril still remains a very good medicine for them so uh, that's something i would advise you to discuss with your psychiatrist if it is even worth taking the risk of switching to uh, uh, some other antipsychotics um or or not because yes clozaril is a very effective medicine unfortunately uh, sedative side effects can occur Thank you. The next question is, what would be your suggestion on Respiron and Ariprazole together for challenging behavior? So, um, oh, can you specify a little bit what kind of challenging behavior? I'm sorry, this is just okay, a question. Okay, one of the, okay uh, fine. Okay, um, risperdal and abilify, they both are antipsychotics. And when you use two antipsychotics together, especially something like risperdal and abilify, which both of them do have a higher likelihood as compared to other uh, antipsychotics such as Seroquel, Zyprexas, so, uh, and some others, Risperdal and Abilify do have a higher uh, chances of causing EPS, the extra pyramidal side effects, uh, those neurological side effects that I uh, mentioned in my presentation. So that's one thing you need to be careful about, that there is no uh, absolute contraindication that you just cannot use the both together. It's nothing like that, but some of these side effects can be additive. Uh, sedation, um, also uh, cardiac, like you may want to, whenever I have somebody on a combination of antipsychotics, I always uh, like to have an EKG, a baseline EKG, and then I periodically monitor EKG because some of them can have some cardiac uh, prolonged conduction kind of side effects. So yes, that's what I would uh, suggest. But uh, first of all, I think, uh, I don't know exactly what behavior uh, uh, you are uh, uh, questioning about, but say if it is for psychosis, hallucination, delusions, or agitation, first, of course, the, the protocol would be to maximize and uh, use a good dose of one medicine uh, before adding the other. So that would be my empiric advice. Thank you. Next question is, how would you deal with the change in high from medicine and substances? High from medications, usually uh, none of these medications are uh, have abuse potential. Of course, there are anti-anxiety medications that may have abuse potential, such as benzodiazepines uh, and some sleep agents. Um, the substance abuse, of course, in itself can cause high. Uh, however, you know, substance uh, abuse, uh, be it any substance such as alcohol, which is ultimately a central nervous system depressant. So it gives you that high in the beginning, but ongoing use, it, it makes you more depressed. So here you are taking an antidepressant, say, and but you are not sober of the alcohol. It's going to kind of negate the effects of antidepressant. Uh, so, you know, it's not going to be as effective uh, if you are having bipolar symptoms and they are giving you mood stabilizer, but somebody has uh, cocaine, say cocaine abuse, cocaine, amphetamine abuse, like uh, Adderall, psychostimulants, that can make you hyper, that can give you manic symptoms. So again, that can be pretty risky and the mood stabilizers are not going to be as effective. So that's how I think it would kind of, uh, you know, not, not a good idea to be, uh, using substances, uh, recreational substances while on psychotropic medication. Thank you. Next question would be, if you tried two different SSRIS and had suicidal thoughts with both the psychiatrists said no, said to continue, but I was too afraid to do so. Also want to stay away from benzos. Are there any other effective meds for anxiety such as Atarex, Indiral. 
Okay, so the question is, let me uh, understand the question better. So the question is that uh, they tried two SSRIs and unfortunately had suicidal thoughts on both of them. So are there any other choices, right? Yes. So yes, so yes, of course, there are other choices. Uh, 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 as I said previously, uh, have, uh, pre uh, precipitating suicidal ideations is a blanket black box warning on all of them. Uh, unfortunately, it, it happened with trials of two antidepressant SSRIs. Uh, for anxiety issues, as I said, SNRIs or even Rameron might be a choice. I do not know your exact, uh, you know, um, uh, your exact symptoms, uh, uh, what exactly, what your symptoms that we need to target. Uh, I, I try to tailor cut individually depending on what symptoms they have and depending on what side effects will be uh, of a concern for them. But yes, there can be other things can be tried, such as SNRI kind of uh, antidepressants or Remeron, or for that matter, Inderal. Inderal uh, may be uh, more good for something, say, like if somebody has like performance anxiety, uh, Inderal is maybe a good choice for that. Others such as Benadryl or Vistril, Vistril as uh, they have mentioned, Atarax. Uh, another uh, twin medicine is called Visteril. Those can be used, but they are more on to be used on an as needed basis. They are not addicting like benzos. So yes, that can be used. But once uh, the effect wears off, you are kind of back to square one. So they can be used on an as needed basis, but for longer term control uh, of anxiety, you may need to explore some more with some other medications. Thank you. Next question is, is there cause of effects connection between thyroid imbalance and mental illness? Yes, uh, so thyroid imbalance, either hypothyroid, meaning underacting thyroid or uh, overacting thyroid can cause a variety of psychiatric symptoms such as depression, anxiety, so it's always a good idea. Somebody who has no past psychiatric history is now feeling depressed or anxious. I always get all the routine blood work done, including thyroid. And probably not just thyroid, might be a good idea to even uh, check some vitamins level like vitamin D, B12, et cetera. Uh, thank you, doctor. Dr. Shah, would it be okay if I ask you just another couple of questions? At this point, I think we will be going over. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, does extended release Luvox cause muscle rigidity, slow movement, and neurological problems? It's not a very common side effect. However, we have to always keep in mind if a certain, if a patient to me, complaints of a certain side effect that just started after taking that particular medicine, then it may be a side effect from that medicine, meaning rare things can happen rarely. So I would, uh, I would try to, you know, probably lower the dose or even stop it and see if the side effects go away. Then, uh, then you know that it is a side effect. It was a side effect from that medicine. Although Luox is SSRI, it's an antidepressant and all antidepressants do not have much of those uh, neurological side effects. They may have some, say like cognitive side effects, not feeling as sharp sometimes, your working memory, but not that kind of muscle rigidity kind of side effects. Uh, I, we do see more commonly, we see that akathisia sometimes on antidepressant, which is more like the restlessness that I described previously. Although, as I said, uh, rarely rare things can happen. And also, if you are taking Luox in conjunction with other psychotropic medication, could it be some kind of interaction and in giving you those side effects? So that's another important thing to consider and explore with your psychiatrist. 
Thank you. Our next question is, are injectable formulations as effective as oral medications? Yes, they are. Uh, they are quite effective, uh, although you have to continue the oral medication for some time period until the injectable kind of gets into your system. But yes, they are quite effective. Okay. Uh, thank you. The next question would be, my son just started clonopin and Halodol shot and Cogentin. I'm sorry, I, I hope I'm saying this Cogentin. right. Cogentin, the clonopin makes him a zombie does he really need it or can he take as needed he has schizophrenia okay so uh, without seeing him uh, and without doing a good evaluation i guess it's not right for me to comment whether he needs it or not it would not be fair for him uh, uh, if i say he needs it or does not need it whichever way Although if he does have history of schizophrenia, my empiric advice is he would need some sort of, uh, some kind of antidepressant, I'm sorry, antipsychotic, which Haldol is an antipsychotic, although it's an older one and therefore more likely to have neurological side effects. And therefore the doctor must have given him the cogentin, which takes care of the <clears throat> Parkinson kind of side effects or tremors from the Haldol. So that's for, usually for that. And clonopin is a benzo. It's usually to kind of relax and uh, helps with anxiety. So if, but if he is feeling too over sedated, I, my best advice would be to uh, touch base with his psychiatrist. If he needs it, all that much dose, can the dose be lowered, so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. Next question, uh, does Zoloft cause thrombocytopenia? Zoloft usually should not cause thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia means uh, a, a decrease in your platelet count. Uh, Zoloft and most SSRIs usually should not uh, cause, although if you are on any other medications such as, say, Depaco, Tegretol, Trileptal, those may be more likely to do so. Uh, Zoloft is not very commonly uh, related to such side effects. Thank you. This would be our last question. For patients with anosognia, the term antipsychotic meds can be the reason why they will not comply. Are there any medications not classified as antipsychotic that are indicated for helping psychosis? Um, okay, yeah. So um, for helping psychosis or anything else that you may want to use, such as sometimes uh, we use uh, to augment the treatment, we use a little bit of mood stabilizer, such as Depakor, Tegret, or lithium even. However, those are all second line medications. They are not for a primary uh, first drug of choice for psychosis symptoms. The first drug of choice is antipsychotic. Uh, however, as I said, with anosognosia, it can be a difficult uh, issue. But <clears throat> if we can work around, as I said, I usually try to uh, ask them what issues are bothersome for them and then uh, work around those and, uh, you know, introduce antipsychotic very gently. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah, so, and for joining and sharing with us this valuable information. If anyone has any additional questions, you can put them in our survey. So before we close this webinar, I would like to share uh, our online resources and information from the NAMI New Jersey website. As you all know, our programs are free and if you want to get involved or to be a member, you can or volunteer with us, click on this tab and choose your options. Uh, click on COVID, let me get this here. Okay, click on COVID-19 information page to access all our services and resources. It's coming up. Okay, there we go. 
here you will find uh, where our statewide online support groups are, local affiliate online support groups, multicultural online support groups, NAMI signature presentation, and let's click on NAMI New Jersey webinar. This is where our webinars like this will be posted along with the presentation slides. Feel free to reach out to NAMI New Jersey for any support you might need. Also, Dr. Shah talked about you know, the resources and support available uh, throughout the state of New Jersey. Here you can see uh, IFSS, that is Intensive Family Support Services. All are listed on our website for each county. So this would be very helpful. Also crisis numbers, cleaning center numbers. And EISS, that is early intervention support services. So thank you again for sharing this hour with us today. As a reminder, it would be appreciated if you could complete the survey at the end of this webinar so that we can incorporate your feedback for future webinars. This concludes our webinar. Thank you all.